Amen. Well, you guys sure are pretty this morning. You know? <laughs> thank you. Thank you. So I appreciate that. But you're not supposed to lie in church, Bill. I'm so, you know, just, I just saying. We just finished up the whole um, uh, Fresh Wind, Fresh Fire, nine weeks of uh, messages on there. If you want to catch up with them, go to YouTube and look it up. They'll be on there. Um, they're in 30-minute intervals or whatever, so you can, uh, can watch them and get caught up on that if you want to. Uh, and, and, you know, Tony's been after me all week, have you got a, have you got a you know, sermon ready? Have you, have you got an idea where we're going and stuff? And I'm like, no, I don't. <laughs> and so uh, last night about 8 o'clock, I finally, you know, the Lord kind of gave me something. I, I've been reading a book, and somebody here gave it to me, or let me borrow it, and I'm, uh, it's called Not a Fan. Who gave me that? Does anybody here that gave me that? Carla Long. Carla Long. Okay. Tell her thank you so much. I'm not giving it back anytime soon, okay? <laughs> but I've been reading this book, and it has really, really just kind of hit me. Uh, when I saw the, the, the name of it, Not a Fan, I thought, well, well what's that about? Are well, they not a fan of Jesus, or are they just not a fan of what? And then as I began to study it out, I began to see. By the way, Mark, did we able to pull up that? That's a big no. Okay, thank you. We'll do it next week. But um, not a fan. And, and many of us, how many of you guys love like football and stuff? Yeah. Okay. Uh, basketball, martial arts, whatever. <laughs> Anything like that. You know. Uh, yeah. Disney on ice. Racing. Racing. Yeah, yeah, there you go. Um, you know, it's, it's, if you look, and when you go to those things, we're all sitting in the audience. We're, we're the fan base. We're sitting there, you know, cheering the team on. Some of us would probably get in the game if we could, but literally we can't because we're not able to. And they won't let you in the game. But when we see Jesus Christ, and I don't call it a game, but uh, Jesus drew huge crowds because they were fans. They became fans of Jesus. And there's a big difference between a, being an inspector and a participator. There's two different things. And, and a lot of people are just inspectors into the Word of God. They're inspectors of, of God's Word and, 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 and the life. But when it comes down to it, we, we don't want to get off the bench. Let them other people play the game. Let them take the tackles. Let them do the hard work. Let me just be a fan. Jesus never wanted fans. And a lot of us have become fans. He wants friends. He wants people that will pick up their cross and, and take the path that he took. And, and, and as a quick overview, we see that the, Jesus taught and he did signs and wonders and miracles and the crowds began to grow and grow and get so much greater all the time because they heard about the miracles, they saw the healings and all those things. And so they would follow him around. But they were really just fans they wanted to see a good show. And Jesus preached life-giving word. He, he brought word to people that, that would set them free. And they would follow until it cost them something. And then you, you separate the, the fans from the friends. You separate the fans for those who are going to participate. And the church has become a whole bunch of fan-based people. And I'm not saying that in a bad way. I'm just saying that, you know, that God wants us more than to be just spectators in what Jesus is doing. Because there's a lot of spectators. But he wants us to be participators. And that's the essence of today's message. In Mark 8, 34 through 35, it says this. It says, and he summoned the crowd with his disciples, and he said to them, If anyone wishes to come after me, he must deny himself 
and pick up his cross and follow me. For whoever wishes to save his life, they're going to lose it. And whoever loses his life for my sake and the gospels will save it. We, we can quote that scripture in and out that, that uh, if anyone wants to follow after me, he must deny himself and take up his cross. If, if you care more, and see a lot of us in the fan base, we care more about, you know, let's keep things just the way they are. My life is good. Don't require more out of me. God. Don't make me come and chase you because that's too much work. I just want to be an inspector. I don't want to be a participator. And the church is there. But I tell you, where God's taken us, we're going to have to quit being in the stands. We're going to have to get off the bench and start getting on the team and jerseying up Ephesians chapter 6. Put on the whole armor of God. There's no need to put on armor if you're not going to go into a battle. And a lot of us would rather not get dressed and just sit on the sidelines, not put on the shoulder pads, not put on the helmet of salvation. Don't go to our loins with the gospel of peace. Don't, don't put on the shield of faith. Because if well, the once we start dressing up, then we're going to have to step out. Enter into the field. I was reading uh, last week, I was talking about David's mighty men. And how that one, one of David's mighty men slew 300 just by himself. And those were bad boys, man. I mean, they were bad mamma jammas. And we see that one place in there that, that three of them, uh, uh, the Philistines was coming and they went and hid in the bushes for a little bit. Then they got it all together and they just walked out into the middle of the field. And said, bring it on. And they slew them all. Whose power were they? They weren't walking in their power. They weren't just fans of David's. They didn't just sit back and watch and hear all the great stories about all the wonderful things that David did. They said, listen, if David's going to fight, I'm going to fight with him. I'm going to get in the game. I'm going to put on the armor of God, and I'm going to fight this battle. And that's where God wants us to be. He wants us to get in the game, not just be a fan. The next probably six, seven weeks, I'm going to challenge you. God's challenging me, so therefore if he challenges me, I get to challenge you. And just know that I love you. <laughs> as far as you know. <laughs> and love hurts. hurts. Mm-hmm, it does. You know, a good show will always draw a big crowd. You know what I'm saying? A good show will always draw a big crowd. I've always wondered this, and, and maybe one of these days I'll get around to it. I don't know. It's just, I've, I've wondered what if we uh, rented out the, um, uh, what, the Bojangles Center, whatever it is. What is it? Co Coliseum, Bojangles. Let's just rent out the Bojangles Coliseum. And nobody knows what's going to go on, but we set a date and a time, and all we put is it. A man of God's going to speak. Curiosity would bring some people, but a lot of people are like, what? Well, who's speaking? I don't know. We just pick somebody out of the crowd that knows the Lord. We say, hey, the Lord wants you to talk. We might have a few people show up. If we asked the churches to participate, there wouldn't be nobody show up. I'm just being honest because we don't want our people going to see somebody else because they might leave and go see them instead of come and see us. That's true. Mm -hmm. Churches have become territorial. <laughs> and that's not the kingdom. 
But if uh, we rented the Bojangles Stadium and said uh, Garth Brooks is getting off, the, is coming back onto the scene, along with Earth, Wind, and Fire, <laughs> boy, that'd be a concert. And Elvis is coming back. That's right. Thank you, Bill. Thank you very much. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, hound dog. Uh, it, would, it would sell out. But they'd just be, none of them would be on the stage. None of them would be in the game. They'd just be enjoying it. And you know what? If... Garth died, I mean, be, well, poor old Garth, he died. It's like, oh, who's that fella that just died? George Jones? Man, that fella, I loved his singing. Because he was hotter than a $2 pistol. <laughs> he was the fastest thing around. Now he lived his life, now he lives down in the ground. So, <laughs> A good show is going to draw big crowds, and we're going to, basically stay in John 6 today uh, for the day. John 6, 1 and 2, and this is just to kind of set us up a little bit. It's after these things, Jesus went uh, to the other side of the Sea of Galilee, to Tiberias, and a large crowd followed him because they saw the signs which was performing to those who were sick. They, they saw the, the anointing of Jesus. They saw the life of Jesus. They saw that this man had power. They know that the, they would heal the sick. The lame would walk. He would cast out demons. And that's a pretty good show. And there were a lot of f Jesus fans. As long as he was doing the show. He didn't have to advertise his, his miracles advertised for him. But... It was, what can you do for me? And I'm going to prove that here in just a minute. Jesus would um, go out into a crowd and speak to them, and they would follow, and they'd see these miracles and things like that. But it really going to boil down to, what can you do for me? And whenever you decide not to do, then you leave. How many of you guys have had people that really want to be your friends when you could help them? I mean, they're you're the best. Oh, man, I, man, I've missed church so much. I just want to come back. Can you pay my light bill? <laughs> <laughs> well, go to Motel L, they, at Motel 8. They'll leave the light on 6. They'll leave the light on for you. You know, one of the motels, you know. But you, they, they want to be your good friends as long as you can do something for them. And whenever you can't do something for them anymore, then you become their enemies again. True situation, a few people know, not many people. But I, I had a fellow that was basically uh, down on his luck really bad. You know, uh, struggling to just you know, have a place to stay. I actually paid for him to stay in a hotel a couple nights. But anyway, he had been talking about this... Um, um, bunch of money that he had coming to him and he says man whenever pastor I promise you when all this money comes the first thing I'm going to do is give money to the church because y'all have fed me y'all have housed me y'all have helped me y'all have done so much for me I am so grateful and it was a fair amount of money probably more than anybody else you know has in their bank account right now and so he, he got that, and I said, well, let's just pray that God will bless it, you know, that you'll receive it, God will bless it. Next thing I know, uh, he got his money, and I can't find him nowhere. <laughs> he done disappeared. But he did show up at church with a brand new car. And... That was the first week. The second week he came back with a different new car because the other car wasn't quite the color that he wanted. So he traded it in and lost a ton of money to have another car. And the next thing I know, because he was single and didn't have no friends at all 
except for us at the church. We was his friends. He got a girl with him. And her six kids. <laughs> and now he goes and gets him a house. Rent, he, he, th he did rent, so I can't you know, beat him up for that. But he rented a house, but then he had me come over. Man, Pastor, I want you to see my house. I'm like, okay. Had a new big 72-inch screen TV, Bose sound surround system, I mean, new carpet, uh, bedroom furniture, probably $10,000 a piece. I'm like, man, bro, I'm glad you're blessing, you know. And I call him out, and I, I call him one because I hadn't seen him. I said, I said, man, I said, what's going on, bro? He says, well, I'm just out uh, with some friends. I said, you mean the friends that come around now that you got money and that uh, you're having to feed them? How many a time has somebody bought you a meal? Well, they don't do it. I said, well, let me, let me just let you know that there's a story called the prodigal son. You probably know about it. That boy had a lot of friends as long as he had the money. As long as he was paying for the party, as long as he was buying the drinks, as long as he hired the disco of the DJ, you know, and, all, and rented the rooms to party, they was there. Man, we love you. I said, promise, I promise you, I promise you that you're going to go through this in no time and your friends that you think are your friends are going to be gone. He said, I know, Pastor, I'm, 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 I've got it all under control. And he said, and I, and I promise you, I'm going to give money to the church. I promise you. I'm like, whatever. Next thing I know, his car's repossessed. His girlfriend and her family's gone. They took the big screen TV, and he ain't got no friends no more. I said, where are all your friends now? He said, when I run out of money, they were gone. I said, bro, I tried to tell you, man. You thought the, your salvation was in the money, but it was in the relationship that you had if you could have nurtured. I said, God gave you enough money, you could have lived the rest of your life and been comfortable. But you had to go blow it on good times. The next call I got was he needed some food. And we took him some. Last time I saw him. See, we're fans as long as there's good times. But whenever, whenever it, gets, it gets tough and, 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 and you know, it's, it's not so fun following now, um, we'll walk away. Same thing happened with Jesus. John 6, uh, 4 through 9 uh, they came together, they had a big, you know, uh, eating on the grounds and gospel music and all that other stuff, you know, chicken and all that other stuff. But there was no concessions at this party. There wasn't no, no you know, there wasn't no hot dogs or beer or, you know, uh, hot pretzels with salt. And there was just, you know, no cheer wine, there was just nothing there. It says in John 6, 4 through 9, it says, Now the Passover, the feast uh, of the Jews, was near. Therefore, Jesus, lifting up his eyes and seeing this large crowd that was coming to him, he said to Philip, he says, uh, Where are we going to go buy bread so that these people can eat? It says that uh, he was saying this to test him, to test Philip. For he himself knew that he, what he was intending to do. Jesus knew what he was getting ready to do. So Philip answered and said, uh, it'd take about 200 denarii and a worth of bread, which would be about a month's worth of income. Uh, and, that's, and that's not enough for him, for everyone to receive just a little. And one of the other disciples, see, he saw this crowd coming and he was thinking ahead of time and he'd already begin scanning and looking over this crowd because he knew there was going to be a need to be met so Andrew Simon Peter's brother said to him he says uh, now there's a little lad over here that he's got five barley loaves and two fishes 
But what are these for so many people? It was just a little. But God will do a lot. And it says that they went on, that they fed. And, then, and at this meeting it says there were 5,000 men, plus women and children. So what do you say? 15, 20,000 people? A couple loaves, a couple fishes. And whenever they had gathered it all up, there was 12 baskets left. Just God showing him the abundance of who he is, that when you follow him and you honor him, that he will give you more than enough. That you'll never get. And when we put our priorities on God instead of on the stuff, God is more than enough. Amen, sister. So they all sat down and eat, and then they all camped out again because they thought, man, this is good deal. This man can turn fishes and loaves into. <laughs> We ain't going hungry no more. We're just going to sit here and wait for tomorrow because supper's coming. But Jesus had other plans. So he left. They're sitting there, where did he go? <laughs> That's our food ticket. That's our meal ticket. But he left. John 6, 25 through 26 says this. It says, when they found him on the other side of the sea, they said to him, Rabbi, when did you get here? And Jesus answered them and, and said, Truly, truly, I say to you, you seek me not because you saw signs, but because you ate the loaves and were filled. Well, well, well you can't do nothing for me now because you're not around, but you didn't come because of the signs and wonders. You come for a free meal. You know? You wanted another Moses McMuffin or something. I mean, you just, you wanted something free. And, 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 and he was a good man to hang on to because where Jesus was, there's going to be food in the house. But he knew their hearts. And he fed them anyway because he loved them. But then he walked away because their hearts were exposed. That they didn't care about the signs and wonders. They just wanted a free meal. And Jesus said to them, I'm saying to you, you, you don't seek me because you've seen the miracles that my Father has done through me. You don't seek me because of the, the healings that you saw. All you care about is what can I do for you? You don't want nothing but a meal ticket from me. You don't care whether I perish or the world perishes. You just care whether you can get a loaf of bread and a, and a fish, you know, fillet of fish from McDonald's. And I love those things, by the way. <coughs> what Jesus was, was, was saying is that you've got to decide what you really want. Who was it that sang that song? I think it was the George, uh, the guy that just died for Billy Graham. George Beverly Shea. George Beverly Shea. His, his, a song I, I never forget. I'd rather have Jesus than silver or gold. I'd rather have Jesus than riches untold. I'd rather have Jesus than anything. I'd rather have Jesus than what the world can bring or something like that. What do we as Christians, what do we really, really want? I mean, do we want just the, the pomp and circumstances? Do we, want, do we want the light show? You know what I'm saying? Do, do, do we want all the frills and, you know, gold toilets and all that other stuff? I mean, what, what is it do we really want? Do, do we want him to just uh, bless us, bless us, bless us, bless us because he said he would and we have no heart toward him? The truth of the matter is that their heart wasn't toward him. He realized why they were there. It was to get some food. And when he'd given them what they wanted, he'd walked away. But a lot of us treat Jesus like a meal ticket. 
Lord, your word says that whenever I pray, whatever I ask, believe it, I receive it, and it shall be mine. Amen. That's the word of God, and I preach it. But it also says if you seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, then all these things will be added unto you. That's the balance of the faith message that you don't hear very often. Listen, God, there's no good thing that God will withhold from his people. He says, I've never seen the righteous forsaken or his seed begging for bread. To seek first the kingdom. And all these other things are going to fall into place. Seek first Christ and you'll never go hungry. What John 6 35 says is Jesus said to them, I am the bread of life. He who comes to me will not hunger. And he who believes in me will never thirst. I call that priority theology. Because we have to prioritize. Where, what do we want? What are we in this thing for? Are we in it just for ourselves? Well, I got saved. I got mine. Let them get theirs. That's not kingdom work. That's selfish greed. While you may be saved, God's not pleased with that. How are you going to get a blessing? When you say, I got mine, let them get theirs. And the church is a lot like that. You know how many churches across the country today are not even going to give people an opportunity to receive Jesus Christ today as the way to heaven? Because it's not seeker sensitive. The, the, the people don't necessarily want to follow when the times are hard. They want the bless me mentality, bless me mentality. And I believe in the bless me mentality, but the bless me mentality has to be lined up with your mentality towards Jesus Christ for God first, put him first place. I mean, he wants to bless you more than you want to be blessed. He's got more favor on you than you could ever ask for. But he also says, Jesus said, if you love me, do what? In other words, your life should prove out your love for me. You say you love me, but I don't see anything. What Jesus is saying, listen, I need runners. I need people that are willing to, to put the armor on and go get out in the field. And, and I'm telling you, the field is white right now for the harvest. And there's only a few willing to do it. And I've come to a revelation that, that, you know, we're seeing horizon grow. Praise God, man. Thank you, guys. But, you know, here's the deal. I don't want to grow up for our seeding capacity. We need to grow up for our sending capacity. How many people can we send out into the harvest field to do the work? Remind me to share something at the end. I could do it right now, but it'll mess me up. Are you, are you here to evaluate or to participate? Do you follow Jesus as an evaluation program that, hey, listen, let me just sit on the sands. Let me sit here and watch the game. You know, uh, I can stay home and get church. Yes, you can. But the Bible says don't forsake the assembling of yourselves together. We need each other. We need human contact because that's how we see the love of God through one another. When we, you know, hug somebody, kiss somebody, tell them you love them in the Lord. People come to church to get built up, not to be tore down. And if you leave here today and you haven't, someone felt that someone loves you, we have failed as a church. Because the greatest of these, 1 Corinthians 12, the last verse says, I'm going to show you a better way. I'm going to show you a better way. And then 1 Corinthians 13, he says, Though I speak with the tongue of men and angels, and if I don't have love... I'm nothing but a sounding brass. It goes through all these things. We can do all these things that look good on the paper, but if, but if we do it without love, we've missed it. Are you here to evaluate or participate? This is interesting, the scripture layout here. Go ahead and flip that. John 6, 60. <laughs> the sixth chapter of John the 60 through 66 is my verse, so the devil must not like this. Amen. 
Therefore, many of the disciples, when they had heard this, this uh, said, says, this is a difficult statement. Who can listen to it? Now, let me, let me bring you up to where we're at here. Jesus is talking to his disciples and the people, and he says, if, if you're going to follow me, you need to eat of my body and drink of my blood. Whoever doesn't do that has no part of me. See, Jesus has been teaching the, the nice 